Uh, good evening. Thanks so much for coming. My name is Andrew Graybill, and I'm a professor of history, and I direct the William P. Clement Center for Southwest Studies here at SMU. Let me thank the many folks who've helped make this evening possible, starting with our good pals at SMU Center for Presidential History, especially Jeff Engel, Brian Franklin, and Rana Spitz. This is a sort of a, um, a coordinated effort. We partner um, our two centers in the history department um, on a couple of speakers every year. And this is our fall, and we'll, we'll do one in the spring as well. At any rate, thanks also to Ruth Ann Elmore, who is the Clement Center's indefatigable assistant director, who also helped with the arrangements for tonight. So this year marks the 10th anniversary of the Clement Center's Senior Fellowship Program, which we established with the help of a very generous anonymous donor um, more than 10 years ago. Uh, tonight's speaker, Sam Haynes, was a recipient of our Senior Fellowship during the 2019-2020 school year, which began with such promise and then ended with COVID-19. But that did not slow Sam, who was on a mission to complete this book during his fellowship year, which is a goal that he very nearly met. I was impressed the fact that Sam was here basically all the time in his office here on the third floor of Dallas Hall, working away. That sort of ended with the bang when uh, the campus closed up tight as a drum, but Sam stuck at it, and he sort of reached the finish line and we are much richer for it. Let me say a little bit more about him. Sam is a professor of history at the University of Texas at Arlington where he has taught, I had to do the math, for nearly three decades. I had no idea. Uh, since 2008, he has served as director of UTA's very fine Center for Greater Southwestern Studies. Sam was born in Shreveport, something that I learned today. I actually thought you were a Texan. It's a little disappointed, um, but all the same. Uh, Sam spent his formative years overseas, however. This part I did know, first in England and then in Switzerland before he came back to the US for college and graduate study at Columbia University and the University of Houston, respectively. Uh, he's heard me say this before, but I'm sure that we'll embarrass him all over again. For my money, Sam is the best historian of the Texas Republic working today. But he has published widely on other subjects as well, including the role of Great Britain in shaping Jacksonian America and a short but very incisive biography of James K. Polk. Of course, he's not here to talk about those books tonight. He's here to talk about his fourth book, which is in its own right uh, quite an achievement. Um, it was published earlier this year by Basic Books. Unsettled land from revolution to republic, the struggle for Texas seeks, in Sam's words, quote, to offer a new interpretation of the founding of early modern Texas. I have to pause there for a moment. I have never heard such a term before, early modern Texas. The historians will laugh and think, is that like a sister field to early modern Europe? Um, no, it's not, but I do like it. I will forever after refer to you as the foremost historian of early modern Texas. Okay. Uh, Sam goes on to say that while the big three, Crockett, Houston, and Travis, dominate the traditional narrative of this era, quote, Texas is one of the most racially diverse regions on the North American continent. And Sam's book shows how its many peoples, Anglos, Mexicans, native groups, and people of African descent, struggled to navigate the chaotic upheaval of the Texas Revolution. Now, I could say this, having read the book. Not only is this a new and fascinating story, it's also one that is exceptionally well told. I have told Sam this. Uh, I've recently finished the book, and it is just beautifully written. I would say that life is too short to read uninteresting, poorly written books, um, and Sam's book will satisfy those of you who appreciate sort of the occasional literary merit that will seep into a work of academic history from time to time. He will be happy to answer your questions afterwards, although maybe not about the terrible season had by his beloved West Ham Hammers. Sorry about that, Sam. I had to check the standings. They're, they're down there in the EPL. And then there are books for purchase and for signing afterwards. You'll step outside, purchase a book, and Sam will sign them for you right here. So please join me in welcoming Sam Haynes. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the Center for Presidential History and also the Clement Center, and especially to Andy and Neil and Ruth Ann. I had a terrific uh, year here. Let's call it nine months. And um, it, then I was sheltering in place like everybody else. But um, I got so much work done. Some of my best writing was done a few feet from here uh, in a very small little office on the third floor with a terrific view of, uh, of, of the campus. So 
here's what I'm going to do. Um, before I start to talk about my book, I want to talk about um, what it is not. Okay, um, it's not a book about the Alamo, um, and I hope I haven't lost half the room uh, at that point. Um, you know, I cover about 25 years in this book. I start in the early Mexican Republic and I go up to the annexation of Texas. It's 400 pages, and there are four pages on the Alamo, and and I got to say that sounds about right to me. Okay, I'm, some people might disagree, but. Um, we have this weird fixation about the Alamo. Um, it's been widely seen as a foundational moment, of course, in Texas history for well over 100 years. Uh, when I pitched this book to uh, basic books in New York, because, of course, the Alamo is very much a part of the American historical consciousness, not just Texas historical consciousness, um, I said, well, you know, there's more to the Texas Revolution than just a 13-day siege in San Antonio. So my editor said, great, I love it. Uh, I signed a contract, I got to work. And after about three years, we were now winding down and doing the final phases of the editing process. And I got an email from the art department. And it said, here is your cover art. And I opened up the PDF and to my horror, uh, <laughs> it was a, an image of the Alamo Chapel uh, with smoke rising from the walls. Um, you know, I, I really didn't know what to do. I, I shouldn't, I, I'm kidding the basic books art department because um, I nixed that idea and I absolutely love the second attempt at uh, a cover for the book. Uh, there are many reasons um, for our fascination with the Alamo and I don't have time to go into them here. Maybe we can talk about them in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, but one reason certainly is that the traditional narrative of the birth of early modern Texas, and thank, I coined that, by the way, I mean, I'm copywriting that, um, has been told almost exclusively by white men uh, and given the academic stamp of approval uh, by Anglo historians and popular writers for more than a century. And for that reason, we still place a handful of white alpha males uh, at the center of this story. We think of the revolution as a gripping saga of outsized figures like, of course, Sam Houston, William Barrett Travis, Jim Bowie, and so on. These are the people who crowd the stage and they elbow aside everyone and everything else. We've told this story exactly the same way for generations. So much so that it's hard to imagine the story unfolding any other way. Now, it is true that some newer works have challenged this celebratory narrative. Maybe you read about the controversy over Forget the Alamo last year, uh, which pointed to the economic motives of, uh, the rebel, of many rebel le leaders who were, in fact, uh, slaveholders. But even a critique of the familiar Texas story can only go so far in altering the way we look at these events. We're still hostage to a narrative dominated by Anglo-American actors. So what is the book about? Um, for much of the period that I study, uh, Texas is, as Andy said, one of the most diverse places in North America. At the time of the revolution, um, people of color comprise about half the population. There are indigenous peoples here, of course, <clears throat> but in the late 18th, in the, in the 18th century, uh, Texas begins to experience something of a population boom. Let's call it a boomlet uh, with the arrival of the Spanish but also the arrival of nomadic and semi-nomadic peoples, the Comanches, the Apaches, the Wichitas. Um, and in the early 19th century, we begin to see um, other Native American groups, <clears throat> Native Americans from the United States, uh, refugees, in fact, uh, who instead of going to Indian territory in Oklahoma and Arkansas, uh, drift across the Red River and down into Texas and make permanent homes uh, in the Piney Woods and, and above. Um, some white settlers, of course, bring um, enslaved people with them, uh, but even that population isn't as, um, is more diverse than you might think. Uh, and the reason is that in the 1830s, there's a very lucrative slave trade, and <clears throat> about half of the people, of the enslaved people living in the Brazos 
River Valley, the lower Brazos River, which is plantation country, about half of those people at the time of the revolution are Yoruba-speaking Africans who have only recently endured uh, the horrors of the Middle Passage. So think of Texas then, um, I, I would urge you to think of Texas as a place of convergence, uh, a place where the peoples of uh, the North American continent and beyond uh, begin to congregate uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries. And what I wanted to do in Unsettled Land was to tell that story, examining a multi-ethnic Texas with all its many moving parts. And, and I really want to be clear about this. I think it's probably the most important point, the most important takeaway of my talk tonight. Um, this is not simply a matter of inserting people of color uh, into a pre-existing narrative. Each of these groups has a story to tell, um, and each needs to be examined separate and apart from the Anglo-American experience. And once you start to weave these multiple narrative threads together, uh, that you end up with a very different story than the one that you started with. So what I wanted to do in Unsettled Land was to take the existing traditional narrative and just set it aside and try to write a history of Texas uh, in the 19th century as if that story was being written for the first time. And so tonight, what I want to do is give you uh, just three examples. I have so many in the book, but just three uh, that I hope will help to explain how this narrative changes and changes in some really fundamental ways uh, when you adopt a wide lens. Got it. Here we go. All right. So uh, we'll start with Stephen F. Austin. Everyone knows Stephen F. Austin, the father of Texas. the most successful uh, Anglo colonizer, to be sure. And he certainly deserves credit as a skillful diplomat uh, who tried to build bridges between Mexican officials and Anglo colonists. But the first Americans to come to Texas um, are Native Americans. Uh, rather, as I said, rather than move into US Indian territory, uh, they come down to Texas. Uh, and in, by the early 1820s, um, there are more Native Americans uh, than you would find in, in Austin's colony, a, a good deal more. Now, ultimately, by the late 20s, I think, and it's really hard to, uh, to run the numbers here, but I think by the late 20s, uh, the Anglo uh, colonies eclipse uh, the Native American communities in East Texas. But nonetheless, um, in the early 20s, you have people coming in from uh, the Lower South, uh, the Upper South, uh, and the Midwest, and they're all coming into East Texas. Uh, and they lobby for a uh, land grant too, uh, just as Stephen F. Austin does. Here we go, okay. Here's a picture of Chief Bowles, <coughs> a very, <coughs> excuse me, prominent Cherokee leader that I talk about. I really would prefer to have used a picture of Richard Fields, but no, none exist to my knowledge. But I talk a lot about Bowles and Fields in the early chapters. Uh, they're Cherokee leaders who decide, and Fields really is spearheading this idea, that the Cherokees need a legal title to the land that they occupy in East Texas. And so in, the, in, in 23 and 24, they're in Mexico City. They meet Stephen F. Austin. They're applying for a land grant just like he is. And you know we don't talk about this much in Texas history, uh, but uh, if you look at the sources, if you look, uh, look at the records, this is a real diplomatic headache for the United States because the U.S. had designs on Texas and at least it hoped that it, acquire, it could acquire part of East Texas by negotiating that boundary. And there were, this was a big problem if thousands and thousands of Native Americans were living in East Texas. The U.S. minister was so worried uh, that the Cherokees might actually succeed uh, that he sent um, secret coded messages back to his superiors in Washington um, about the state of the, uh, the, the Cherokee campaign. Um, now, in the end, the Cherokees were unsuccessful. Austin succeeded. They did not. Um, and over the next several years, they would try again. And then they would try again and again. And it's one of the most uh, poignant stories, I think, in the entire book. And, uh, and in, the, in the end, um, uh, Chief Bulls, 
is so frustrated uh, by the Mexican government's inaction that he decides to remain neutral uh, in the Texas Revolution. And you can make a pretty good case uh, that that decision has an enormous impact on the outcome of the revolution, may have decided that outcome. Um, so the immigrant tribes were squatters. They did not have legal title. I get that. Uh, they did not have permission to be there as Austin did. Don't forget there were many Anglo-American squatters as well. We sort of assume that all some of our Anglo-Americans who lived there uh, were colonists. Uh, they were not. But whether they were residing legally in Texas or not, the Mexican government had no intention or desire um, of removing them. These were people who had established homes long before in Texas, long before uh, most of the famous leaders of the revolution had ever thought of making a trek westward uh, across the Sabine River. I'm not trying to suggest here uh, that uh, we shouldn't prioritize uh, Austin's efforts to establish an American colony. Uh, the creation of Anglo-American uh, communities will always be uh, the headline when we talk about uh, the early settlement of Texas during the Republic, Mexican Republic period. But the migration of Native Americans is an important study too, and it's been largely ignored. Maybe um, if you're familiar with your Texas history, then you know that Mirabeau Lamar expels the Native Americans, these are the immigrant tribes that I'm talking about, uh, in 1839, three years after the revolution. Uh, we know quite a lot about that, uh, but we know very little about this migration of Native Americans uh, into East Texas uh, in this period. Uh, we are focusing exclusively, it seems to me, on Stephen F. Austin, and that's really the only case that I'm trying to make. So a wider lens changes the story in other ways, too. Uh, individuals who were once seen as peripheral uh, suddenly take on new significance. I'm sorry, I have to remember where these buttons are. And the, uh, the best example of that is really Lorenzo de Zavala. Usually mentioned as a Yucatan intellectual who happened to show up in Texas, who signed the Declaration of Independence, uh, who agreed to serve as vice president of the uh, new Texas Republic. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, that's about all the attention that he gets. Uh, he's just simply not regarded as an important figure of the Texas Revolution. And the reason is because uh, for all the attention we have given to these events, uh, we really haven't spent enough time looking at the Mexican side. Uh, we study William Barrett Travis, and we know everything there is to know about Sam Houston, but how does this look from Mexico City? That really is, I think, one of the understudied aspects of this entire affair. Don't forget, I mean, this is really beyond debate. This is a Mexican story before it becomes an American one. I really can't emphasize that enough. I talk about Zavala a lot in Unsettled Land. I think in chapter one, if I may be wrong, certainly chapter two, and he's probably in every chapter until his death. And um, he's important for all kinds of reasons, but one way is that he understands far more and far sooner than, than Me other Mexican leaders that there is a fortune to be made in East Texas lands, uh, but only if Anglo-American immigration can continue. And so there is no bigger booster uh, in Mexico City for Anglo immigration uh, than Lorenzo de Zavala. He has an empresario contract, uh, uses his political context to, uh, to acquire this contract, and then immediately turns around and sells it to American investors, which he's not actually supposed to do. Um, but for the purpose of my talk, I don't want to talk about his land deals. I go into those in the book. I really want to talk about his relationship with another famous um, figure in, this, uh, in these events, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. This image, by the way, is from the uh, SMU library, um, which you may not have seen this, but it's a terrific image of Santa Ana. Um, all the other ones show him in, you know, in uh, fancy military dress uniform, and he's very dashing. Uh, I prefer this one. This is the one. He looks like a Mexican civil servant, and this is the image that I used for the book. Um, Santa Ana has been so misunderstood 
Uh, again, I don't want to get off topic here, <laughs> but um, to Texas historians frequently, he's been characterized as this tyrannical, uh, almost a cartoon-like sort of tyrannical dictator. Um, you know, he wasn't, at least not in the 1830s. Uh, but even Mexican historians have had a hard time figuring him out. Um, they tend to be a lot more objective about Santa Ana than Texas historians, by the way. Uh, but even they, at times, have sort of thrown up their hands and said, you know, this guy is a complete enigma. Um, I am only speaking for myself. You can take this or leave it, for what it's worth. Uh, I tend to see Santa Ana in very much the same terms as Andrew Jackson. I teach Andrew Jackson uh, at the graduate level at UTA. Um, He's also someone that historians have had a hard time figuring out. Um, you know, is he a Southerner, really? Uh, is, that his, is, that his, is that what defines him, his Southerness, or is he a Westerner? Is he a liberal? Is he a conservative? Uh, is he a strict constructionist or a loose constructionist? I mean, good grief. My students say, for God's sakes, you know, make up your minds. I mean, there is no consensus on Andrew Jackson at all. And, and this is the same sort of thing. I mean, I think Santa Anna and Andrew Jackson have a lot in common. They are um, uh, national heroes. Uh, Santa Anna has um, uh, uh, defeated the Spanish uh, at Tampico. Uh, Andrew Jackson, of course, uh, the British at New Orleans. And they are, you know, backcountry military leaders. They are not uh, ideologues. Um, they are, um, they're not deep thinkers. And so when we look at other important figures from that era, statesmen like Henry Clay in the United States or Lucas Aleman in Mexico, we cannot compare these men to those figures. Um, Santa Ana is sometimes referred to as ideologically flexible. Yeah, I would put it another way, um, you know, he really has no ideology at all. And um, he's, he just hasn't thought that much about it. And if you want to understand both men, what I think you do is um, try to understand uh, who their political uh, enemies uh, and allies are at, at any given moment. Uh, both men see politics uh, in intensely personal terms. And so that's especially true of the relationship that Santa Ana has uh, with Lorenzo de Zavala. Um, this relationship goes way back, uh, back into the early 20s. And uh, long before, a, a decade or more, uh, before the uh, Texas Revolution breaks out. And, you know, when I was working on this talk, I thought, okay, so this is where I lose everyone. Uh, I don't want to do a deep dive into the weeds of Mexican politics. It gets pretty Byzantine even on a good day. And, I, you know, I just, but it's important. Take my, take my word for it. I'll be quick. Um, this relationship is a fascinating one, and I spend a lot of time on it in the book. They conspire to overturn the presidential uh, results uh, in 1828. Uh, they install a figure who would more to their liking, someone who they hope they can control, uh, Vicente Guerrero. And, you know, they're right for a while anyway. Um, but ultimately, they have a falling out, and uh, Zavala flees to the United States. Um, sells his empresarial contract, marries an American woman, um, has a pretty good time of it, actually. Um, but there, he and Santa Ana are ultimately reconciled, and he returns to Mexico in the early 30s. Uh, then he's, uh, he accepts an appointment, Zavala accepts an appointment as minister to France, and he's in Paris when Santa Ana overturns uh, the election of 1824. And uh, that's when uh, you see this irreparable breach between these two men. Uh, Zavala is a Federalist, a staunch Federalist, and uh, he's willing to bend the rules a bit here and there, uh, but he is absolutely appalled by Santa Ana's actions. And so he makes a break with Santa Ana in a, the most public way possible, in a way that was clearly designed to infuriate uh, the president of Mexico. He resigns, of course, sends a, a very polite diplomatic letter saying that his services uh, can no longer, would, he, he can no longer serve the, uh, the new regime. But then he writes a scathing editorial, which he publishes in the opposition newspapers in Mexico. 
And in that letter, uh, he says that Santa Ana has torn the Constitution to pieces. Well, so he's immediately recalled uh, to the Capitol. Um, and he doesn't go. Um, he decides that rather than face the fury of the Mexican president, uh, he should um, go to Texas. And he lets it known that he wants to take up the life of the country squire in Texas. Uh, nobody uh, believes him, uh, least of all Santa Ana. Uh, it's widely assumed uh, that he is conspiring to lead a Federalist counter-revolution. And that is, in fact, exactly what he's doing. And so he arrives in the summer of 1835. The revolution breaks out in the fall, don't forget. He arrives in the summer of 1835. And um, that's what he thinks will happen. And that's what Santa Anna thinks he is going to do. Um, that causes a sensation in Mexico City when it is learned that Zavala is now in Texas. And if you look at the correspondence, they are absolutely obsessed with this idea. And the word of Zavala, that the Zavala is now in Texas, finally makes it way, its way down to uh, Santa Ana, who is in Veracruz at the time, or nearby Veracruz. And it's really then, uh, in the late summer, early fall of 1835, that a military campaign is um, that the, the Mexican government decides to launch a military campaign into Texas. Um, that is a major undertaking. Um, don't think of the Mexican army as just sort of waiting for the green light uh, to, to head north. Uh, they need special financing uh, for this army to be um, supplied. Uh, they have to acquire, it's a logistical nightmare as you might imagine. Uh, um, there is a core uh, Mexican army which makes that trek northward, but it's supplemented by uh, volunteers who have had very, very little training and are very, very poorly provisioned. But Santa Ana is determined at this point, at this point, to lead a campaign into, um, into Texas. Um, and this is before you really see, uh, you really get a sense of, what the, of where the Anglo-American community is going. Um, the revel the shots aren't even fired until October of 35. You have the siege of San Antonio in December of uh, 1835. But the Mexican uh, government is already planning a major campaign. So my point here is it's not what Anglos are doing. It's what Zavala is doing. Now, things don't go the way Zavala planned, actually. Um, when he arrives in Texas, there are some colonists who are very suspicious of him. Um, they want nothing to do with him. Uh, he is politically active. He's a, a confidant of Stephen F. Austin trusted ally of Stephen F. Austin. There's no question about that. But once the rebellion begins, it's pretty clear this is going to be uh, an Anglo rebellion and that fe Mexican Federalists will play, at best, a subordinate role. And by the time the Mexican army is moving northward, Santa Ana has figured this out too. He realizes that Zavala is no longer in charge. This has now become uh, an American rebellion. Anglo colonists and American volunteers who've recently arrived from the United States. But even so, Zavala is never far from Santa Ana's mind. Uh, after he lays siege to the Alamo, he pushes on to the Brazos River, uh, where he makes the greatest mistake of his military career, and it's a doozy. Um, he knows that Houston's army is a few miles upriver. Uh, but he also learns, when he gets to the Brazos, that the Texas government, and that's a rather fancy word for David G. Burnett uh, and Lorenzo Zavala on two mules, uh, but they are heading east as fast as possible to Harrisburg, and they're perhaps maybe a day's uh, march away. So rather than engage Houston's army, and in fact, without even telling his own generals, he's off the east side of the Brazos, and he takes off. And off he goes in pursuit of uh, Burnett, of course. But I think we can safely assume who he's really going after. He's going after Lorenzo de Zavala. Uh, the opportunity to bring Zavala back to Mexico City in chains was a 
was going to be a great coup, a great feather in his cap. Um, so I want to make the point then that a broader perspective doesn't just expand the scope of what we, um, what we should know, uh, but it also helps to shed light on those things we thought we already knew. I hope that's clear. Um, even, and I'm talking to the traditionalists here, really, okay? Even if you subscribe to that traditional interpretation, surely you'd want to know uh, why the Mexican army arrives in San Antonio in the dead of winter, um, weeks or months before it was expected, uh, and uh, not the spring, uh, and caught the Alamo defenders uh, completely unawares. If you're familiar with, if you really know your Texas history and you know that about the day that, they, uh, that the Mexican army marched into town, uh, you know that the Anglo defenders, uh, that it was pretty chaotic. They were running into, that, uh, into the Alamo mission pretty quickly and leaving a lot of things behind that they, that they needed, uh, like rifles and ammunition. There's a great letter of Santa Ana said, well, we, there's this house we're occupying. There's 50 rifles and ammunition here. Uh, they had left in such a hurry into uh, the walls of the Alamo. They literally didn't expect the Mexican army to arrive. They were partying. It was George Washington's birthday the night before. That's pretty much what they were up to. Um, but my point is, oh, and so I got off track. I'm sorry. Uh, you would want to know, if you were a traditionalist, how this army shows up so quickly. And you would want to know, what is the Mexican president doing uh, leading it? Uh, he could have um, assigned this campaign to his, uh, to his general staff, and he does not. Uh, and then why does he make this decision at the Brazos River to head southeast and to find uh, Zavala? We can't understand these things if we don't know the role that Zavala plays. Okay? Now... So I said at the beginning that we've really ignored Zavala. And if you want to know how we've ignored him, uh, here is Exhibit A. Those of you who've done any research in the Texas Revolution or done any genealogical work in that area know that um, John H. Jenkins' 12-volume compendium, uh, The Papers of the Texas Revolution, is absolutely indispensable. You have to have it. Every letter Sam Houston got, every letter Sam Houston wrote, every letter that mentioned Sam Houston is in there. Uh, and you can say the same for Travis and Bowie and Crockett and everybody else you care to name. And of course, you know, for those of us who do research, uh, what do you do first? Um, this is what I tell my students, they never listen to me. You check the index, <laughs> volume 12. You go to the index. You don't just start on page one. Go to the index in John Jenkins' Papers of the Texas Revolution and go to the last page. I dare you, because this is what you will find. Zavala, Lorenzo Day. <laughs> what, what the hell? Uh, too numerous to list. Uh, what is going on here? I mean, that really speaks volumes. Um, it, it, it tells us two things. It tells us about Zavala's importance because there's so many of them. And it tells us about the stunning lack of interest that we've shown in trying to find out who this guy is. Um, I uh, mentioned this to a friend of mine who's a, a Texas historian. And um, I said, do you believe this? That Zavala, they don't even met, list his, his uh, correspondence? And he thought about it for a while, and he said, well, maybe um, his name begins with the letter Z. And by uh, the time Jenkins was wrapping it up, he thought, oh, to hell with it, and <laughs> send it off to the publisher. And I thought, you know, uh, that makes a weird kind of sense, actually. Uh, but the more I thought about it, of course, I mean, look, if the father of Texas' last name began with a Z, his correspondence would be in volume 12. Uh, if the hero of San Jacinto's correspondence, um, if, his, if his name began with the letter Z, his correspondence would be uh, in volume 12. You know, think about all the hundreds of books that have been written about the Texas Revolution, and how could American historians possibly missed the important role that Zavala plays 
And the answer is pretty simple. I mean, we've made the story all about us. This is a Mexican story before uh, it's an American one. Okay, so finally, I, I wanna talk about the Texas Revolution as a term, okay? Um, the language that we use to describe these events. And here I always get into trouble with my students because when I get into, we talk about things like nomenclature, it's like, oh God, don't, you, don't historians have something better to do? Um, and, and sometimes I agree, but on this occasion I don't. Uh, tech, are we calling it a revolution or not? What do we call it? Um, you know, is it a important, long-lasting, political and social upheaval? Or is it just another chapter in the process of American expansion across the continent? It's just part of Manifest Destiny? Or does it deserve to be seen as one of the world's great revolutions? Well, Texans were pretty sure uh, how it should be regarded. Because they were calling it the revolution from the get-go. And the reason was, um, they were constantly looking for validation for the American Revolution. And so, you know, Stephen, F Washington is the father of his country, uh, Austin's the father of our country. They're calling theirs a revolution, we're calling ours a revolution. Um, but historians have always been, you know, kind of uncomfortable with the term. And, um, and David Weber, the founder of the Clement Center, back in the 80s, said, really? Uh, is this really a revolution? Uh, or is it just simply, you know, Texas braggadocio? And a, a lot of um, Texas historians, not all by any means, but a lot sort of took, um, followed his lead. And I'm certainly one of them. Uh, I was really wrestling with this. And I got, you know, here I'm writing a book on the Texas Revolution. What am I calling it? Well, I called it a war of uh, secession movement. I call it a war of independence. I call it rebellion with a lowercase r. But I tried to avoid using the term Texas Revolution. And then somewhere in the middle of the book, I realized, you know what, Texas Revolution works pretty well. Um, you know, the fact is that we think of the Texas Revolution in very, very narrow terms as a war to free Texas from Mexican rule. And it always seems to conclude, at least when you watch, watch it on film or TV, it always seems to conclude with a blast of trumpets and a crash of cymbals uh, with Sam Houston's uh, decisive victory at San Jacinto. Uh, but the revolution is far from over in 1836. Uh, the work of creating a new society, uh, one that is so different from anything that Texans knew under Mexican rule, that, had only, that process had only just begun. Um, for a large segment of the population, um, the Texas Revolution means the loss of freedom. A fact that only becomes apparent if you um, carry the narrative forward uh, past 1836 uh, into, the, uh, into the Republic years. As the Lone Star government moves aggressively to expel Indians and marginalize Mexicans and tighten its grip on uh, people of African descent. Uh, and so that's why um, I think it is a revolution. We just simply have to change the way we look at it. We have to change the way we, um, the way we frame it, okay? You maybe you know this already. After three years, Native American refugees that we've talked about with Chief Bowles, they're gone. Uh, only the Alabama Cushadas remain. Uh, they have been expelled, forcibly removed from Texas. Maybe you remember from your Texas history class in seventh grade, which is a long time for some of us, uh, you know, maybe you remember that Tejanos fought alongside Anglos in the Texas Revolution. You know, and that's true. Some of them did. Uh, but they all lived to regret it. Some of them didn't, by the way. And I talk about those Tejanos as well. But if you find the Tejanos that support the rebellion, uh, the De Leon and Benavides family, they're the biggest backers of the Anglo Rebellion in the fall of 35. Uh, and after the revolution is over in the summer of 36, they're marched down to the coast and they're put on ships uh, and they're sent into forced exile uh, in New Orleans. Uh, after the Cordoba Rebellion in 38, uh, the Mexican community in and around Nacogdoches is forced to flee, uh, fearing white reprisals. Uh, Juan Seguin, who famously 
um, fights alongside Sam Houston at the Battle of San Jacinto, he leaves in 1842. And that year, many uh, uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of Mexican families uh, in, in the San Antonio area made the trek with him. Uh, what about the lives of um, people of African descent? Well, the lives of slaves, of course, remains essentially unchanged, but uh, the Texas Constitution does enshrine the institution of slavery, something the US Constitution does not do. Um, in the Texas Constitution, it says the institution, Texas Constitution, it says the institution can't be infringed upon or curtailed in any way. Uh, and I think life probably changed most dramatically for uh, free people of color. Uh, and one of the people I follow in this book is William Goyens, who is a, a free black businessman in Nacogdoches, uh, and a very prosperous one. Um, before the War of Independence, uh, he could vote, and he did more than that. He was actually quite active politically, uh, according to the records that we have. Um, he could represent himself in court, and he did a lot uh, because he was very litigious. Uh, and after the war, he could do none of these things, uh, even though he had played a significant part in the rebellion uh, as a translator and intermediary uh, with the Cherokee Indians for Sam Houston. There were really severe uh, restrictions placed on free blacks during the Republic period, um, and some of which um, Goyans, because of his wealth and prominence, uh, was able to avoid. Uh, but in 1842, Congress passed a law uh, that attempted, not very successfully, attempted to expel uh, free blacks from Texas. And Goins was obliged to uh, call upon his political friends to sponsor a special bill on his behalf so that he could, set, so that he could stay. Now, no one is going to argue, and I'm not arguing here, that Mexico, the Mexican Republic during this period, is a colorblind society. Uh, it's not. Uh, but it is a multi-ethnic one. And after 1836, people of color would find their lives upended by this seismic transition to white rule. Um, if we're going to arrive at a real understanding of what the Texas Revolution means, then we have to look at everyone. And the story comes, and that story comes into view um, only when the smoke clears uh, at San Jacinto. Oh, I'm sorry, did not expect that to be that loud. So to return to my main point, uh, we just can't shoehorn the experiences of other peoples, Hispanos, Native Americans, people of African descent, into a traditional narrative uh, that is primarily interested in highlighting the heroic exploits of white alpha males. What do we get when we employ a wider lens to see the Texas Revolution? We get a larger cast of characters, of course, but much more than that, I think, a fuller and in many ways richer picture comes into view. Thank you very much. Huh? So, does anybody have any questions? Oh, uh, Brian, are you going to be moderating? Yeah, there'll be a couple of microphones, one on that side, one on this side. So, um, I'll let uh, Dr. Haynes call on you, but if, if you've got a question, raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you. at the most popular Texas history school book at the seventh grade level about a year ago. And you know, I, in a former life, Andy didn't mention this, but I actually taught Texas history for a year uh, in a, a school in Houston. And I don't know that it changed all that much. Uh, this was back in the 80s. Uh, it was, it, it's still very much a traditional narrative. And, and I think the problem is that people think that if we start chipping away at that traditional narrative, uh, then we'll get forget the Alamo, you know, in its place. And, and I'm not really sure, I'm not convinced that's, that that's the case. I think you can make, and I speak to teachers, teacher groups all the time, and I try to tell them, look, you can tell this story uh, in a different way. It's a little bit complicated, and it requires a little bit more effort on, you, on your part, but, you know, um, 
It's got to be done. Can I give this to you if you're going to roam around? Oh, if I'm going to what? If you're going to roam around. Oh, I'll roam around. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I hope this is a brief question. You mentioned Zavala was a Federalist. Yes. What do you mean by that? Oh, I'm sorry. So in uh, the Constitution of 1824, um, the... Uh, Mexican government create, well, there's a constitutional convention, and they create a, uh, a federal constitution. It's very similar in many respects to the U.S. Constitution. It grants the outlying states greater autonomy. And so for the next 25 years or so, Mexican politics is divided between federalists and centralists. They're not, a, they're not parties per se. They're more factions. Where we get Santa Ana wrong, and I know you asked me about Zavala. Zavala is a true blue federalist all the way. Uh, Santa Ana appears to be a Federalist for quite a while, and then in 1834, he takes steps to abolish that Constitution, and very often people say, well, he's now changed his stripes and he is a Centralist. That's not quite true. Um, he's, uh, again, he's, he's very hard to pin down ideologically, um, but uh, he was not the uh, Federalist ideologue uh, that Zavala was. Now, when Zavala learned that Santa Ana had closed the gates, of the, the doors, locked the doors of the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate, he was absolutely furious. He never forgave him for it. Yeah. Uh, question. Can you wait for the mic real quick so that we can all hear you? Uh, Thanks. You could probably be loud. Uh, much is made of Austin's focus on education policy in the Texas Republic. Uh, but my question is, how does like Texas Republic treat education policy for its citizens and in the scope of those larger communities? Well, I, education in what regard? I'm, when I think about education during this period, I think of Mirabeau Lamar, um, things like that. Um, so I, I'm not sure I know enough about Austin's attitudes toward education. Yeah, because I know they were like basically the idea that there should be some sort of Texas public schooling I, available. Okay. And whether what communities that was actually available to. Okay. Okay. I, I, I don't know about Austin, but I do know that Mirabeau Lamar is given credit. That's why we call him the father of Texas education. Um, don't get me started, actually. Uh, I, I, the title father of, ed, of Texas education, I think, is not a title that Lamar really earns. Um, he is um, president when, and I've forgotten the name of the education bill, uh, when it passes, um, but uh, it, it's not his bill. Um, I mean, I'm sure he was in favor of education. I'm not saying he was against it. But the uh, moniker, father of Texas education, uh, is invented by the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. Uh, and the Daughters of the Republic of Texas loved the fact that he had done something for education. Because the DRT really saw themselves as an education group. Uh, their whole point was to um, educate and inspire future generations. And so that's why, if you go to the San Jacinto Monument, uh, you see Mirabeau Lamar listed as the father of Texas education. How much about, how much uh, on education was really done uh, in the late 30s or the 40s for that matter. Um, I'm going to take a stab in the dark and say nothing. Okay? Uh, it happened later, uh, and, uh, uh, but Lamar has gotten all the credit for it. But, you know, Lamar does other things too, and I'll leave you to judge whether or not he should be known as the father of education or for other things uh, like his Native American policy. Okay? Just me. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I, I read a book that proposed that the main reason that the, uh, the Anglos <laughs> tried, to, tried to kick out Mexico was that Mexico wanted there to be no slavery in these lands, uh, in, in Texas. They were really interested in East Texas and, and the, the mm -hmm. but but the people that had come in and from the colonies wanted to keep slavery because they were making a lot of money from it, and they okay you know they put and and, and also I th I thought it really interesting that the heroes of the Alamo like Crockett and Bowie and all them they had come in trying to get land because they had lost they were older sure. kind of long in the tooth. They were coming here to just settle down and get some land and 
live to be old men, but so, here they are. <laughs> so I, I th it sounds to me like you have read uh, Forget the Alamo, okay, uh, which really got a lot of attention for the um, uh, for its critique of the Alamo defenders and uh, major uh, Texas leaders, white leaders, um, because they were slaveholders and uh, were then uh, motivated uh, for economic reasons. You know, um, very, very briefly, this has become a really highly charged debate. Uh, my view is that um, it isn't slavery. Um, that slavery, with the caveat, and I want to be really clear here, with the caveat that if you're talking about people uh, white Americans from the South, Lower South or Upper South, slavery is involved in some way. My own view is that um, these are really intractable, ordinary people. And they come to Texas uh, and uh, don't forget, there are three revolts in Texas in the space of 10 years. And one of those years, uh, there's a cholera epidemic and nothing's, no one's doing anything. Uh, so in 10 years, you have three revolts, one in 26, 27, and that's really about a land deal that goes sour. Then you have in uh, 32, it's complicated, but I would say if I had to generalize really about uh, customs duties and uh, regulations over customs on the coast. And then you have the third one, the one that we know, and I would say it's really, it happens so, so quickly. It ha um, it, the reason is uh, the sudden influx into Texas of Mexican troops, and that's the catalyst. But is it slavery? Would I use slavery as an overarching framework? I wouldn't. And the reason is because, one reason is because um, rebellions tend to be pretty ad hoc affairs. It's not like these people have an agenda. It's sort of like asking the people in Paris in 1789, storming the Bastille, what's your end game? Uh, they don't really have one. Uh, and that's the same thing is true here. Now, um, it becomes about slavery really fast. And then by the time you get to annexation, it's all about slavery. And Texas has become the third rail of American politics. But in 1835, I, I, would, I would not say it's all about slavery. I, I just wouldn't go there. Yeah. I don't need a mic. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Uh, yes, that's been a fascinating review. I knew nothing about that history, and especially of all of the Native Americans that migrated in. And a question I have is, obviously there are many factors involved, but the, uh, I heard one time that one reason, I mean, obviously the governments in Mexico City, 1700s and 1800s had to know that inviting all these Europeans and Americans into Texas was a threat, you know, that they would revolt. And I heard someone say they did this because they went ahead and accepted the colonists because they feared the Comanches more than they did the uh, uh, Americans and the Europeans. That's one reason. It's absolutely one reason. That was the reason behind the entire immigration policy. It didn't work out the way they hoped because what they thought they were getting was an international community of settlers. And um, because land speculation um, was so, um, uh, had become a mania in the United States, Americans are pouring in in extraordinarily large numbers. And once you try to close the door, or at least try to shut it a little bit, uh, uh, that door on American immigration, you know, good luck. Once it's open, it's open. And they couldn't stop them even after 1830 when uh, they passed the April 6th, 1830 law. But to your question, uh, initially, we need a big population up here uh, because to populate is to govern. And um, they wanted not just uh, settlers, Anglo-American settlers and settlers from Europe, but that was part of the appeal of having Cherokees there too. Uh, it took them by them, I mean the Mexican government. It took the Mexican government a long time to figure out that Cherokees are not Comanches. Um, they just didn't really understand. And the, they get these letters from the north, from these Mexican officials, and they say, these Indians are, you know, they, they, uh, um, 
they make their own cotton clothing and they're farmers and they're ranchers and livestock uh, raisers. And it, it took a while for that to seep in. And by the time it had, it's a terribly sad story, but by the, t they just never get around to giving the Cherokees legal title. And by 1836, uh, people like Chief Bowles are hopping mad. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for sharing your comments. I'm understanding from you, it was more of a cultural uprising, and I had been probably misled by the importance I understood the Mexican government, especially the locals, were going to restrict the number of slaves that could come in, and that was a motivating factor. I, you know, I just, again, they there had, had been a very near miss on the issue of slavery. I mean, back in, um, was it 1829 when Guerrero passes the Emancipation Act? Uh, it looks like slavery is, um, is doomed in Texas, uh, and that is narrowly averted to, through the efforts of Stephen of Austin, uh, because he has powerful friends, uh, both locally and nationally, and they make an exception in the case of, te of Texas. But if there was going to be a revolt over slavery, and just over slavery, I would say it would have been in 1829, not in 1835. I mean, it's, the whole region seems to be fairly peaceful in the summer of 35, and then uh, Mexican troops arrive, uh, several hundred of them. And uh, it really does create a panic. And so I guess the case that I'm making is really more sort of a, a short-term catalyst. Uh, it's not so much slavery, it's the sudden presence of troops. But again, they're Southerners. Uh, they uh, have enslaved people uh, on their farms and plantations. And so yes, slavery is important to them. I actually think, and, and I talk about this in my book, that we don't spend enough time looking at these Yoruba-speaking Africans uh, from the Bight of Benin, who had just made the trick, the, the trek, they were, they didn't speak English, uh, they didn't speak Spanish, uh, they hadn't even been, they were bought from the slave pens of Cuba, they hadn't even learned any Spanish, they'd only been there a matter of weeks. And there is a huge cultural divide uh, when these people arrive. I mean, African Americans couldn't communicate with them, uh, had nothing in common with them. And I'm, the way I read the primary sources, when the revolution begins, uh, there is this terror. Uh, white slave owners were always, of course, afraid of their slaves. But the, in, the, in the primary source literature, they talk again and again and again about the quote unquote wild Africans. And when, they, when you see wild Africans in the primary source record, they're talking about the Yoruba speaking Africans who have just arrived, not the people that they brought with them from the United States. Yeah, in the back. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, great. Stephen of Austin was a Spanish citizen and so when he came, do you think that if they had, he had avoided the arrest and hadn't been arrested that things might have worked out a little differently? Because he was so pro-Mexico, he was completely there until he got sent to it. And, and that's what changes his mind about the, yes. You know, that's a great point for those of you who don't know. Um, Stephen F. Austin is arrested. He, he has come down to uh, negotiate with the Mexican government for a statehood, um, and he's frustrated when things don't go according to plan, uh, writes a rather intemperate letter to uh, the San Antonio Ayuntamiento, and Spanish, Mexican authorities get wind of it, and, and he's arrested and spends uh, the next, uh, what, year and a half? Uh, it, he's in jail in Mexico City, then he's under house arrest. It's get, it gets kind of complicated. But he hasn't come back to Texas until the fall of 35. Um, you know, um, I'm glad you asked that question, uh, and I don't know if I'm gonna give you the answer that you want. Um, I um, didn't, I don't know why I'm apologizing. Uh, I, I did not set out to um, take a, 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 I don't know, to take a negative view of Stephen of Austin. But the more I got into it, um, the more, it, number one, it was like, well, wait a minute, are we going to call him the father of Texas? There are all these Native Americans here in East Texas. Uh, that was one thing, uh, but it was really his career afterwards. And so here's my take on it, and for what it's worth, you know, take it or leave it. My take is, um, he's great at negotiating with Mexican officials. And he is the linchpin between that colony and Mexico City, between that colony and the governor. 
But after, by the early 30s, Texas is becoming more and more Anglo-American. And what does that mean? That means he is more and more irrelevant. And so, you know, I don't think, that I know there are people in the Brazos River Valley who could care less what he says as early as 1831. Uh, and then 1832. That's just my personal opinion. There is a famous episode. Um, I'm going to, you know, uh, I'll, I'll make this brief, but one of the great stories of Stephen of Austin is he's been in jail, or he's been in Mexico anyway, for two and a half years. And he comes back uh, to um, the Brazos in September. And he gives a famous speech in September. They have a banquet for him, and he says, War is our only resource, something like that. Actually, it's resource in the literature. It, it should be recourse. I agree. That's what it is in the textbook. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, I, I've seen it. It's resource, and um, I, I don't know. I would. I would prefer. It's a. It must be a misprint. Recourse. He says war is our only resource. Recourse, and that is seen. And I know your textbook says this. If Absolutely. that is seen, that's when everyone sees the light in the Anglo-American community, oh, well, if Stephen of Austin is for this, then we're all for it. I don't buy that at all. And the reason is because he gets off the boat from Mexico. He's sailed from Veracruz to New Orleans and New Orleans to uh, Velasco Beach. When he sails from New Orleans to Velasco Beach, that ship is running guns into Texas. And when he disembarks, uh, that ship is fired on by a Mexican uh, clipper ship. Uh, the, his ship is the San Felipe, the other one is called the Carrero. And um, everybody in this room, I think, knows that the, the Texas Revolution begins when? On October 2nd, the Battle of uh, Gonzales. Well, yeah, but there's actually that naval battle you know, in the middle of September. And my uh, feeling is this war's happening. Uh, and it doesn't matter what Stephen F. Austin says. And so... Um, you know, why do we put so much stock in Stephen F. Austin? I, I think one of the reasons is because he is so, he is the agent of compromise. He is uh, the man who both sides look to un until they don't. Uh, and then in 1835, I think um, it, it helps to validate the Anglo-Texas cause because you have all these hotheads and these firebrands running around. And then when Stephen F. Austin finally says, there's nothing we can do. That seems to legitimize the Texas, um, the Texas cause. But I would say, um, you know, he's really behind the curve on so many of these things. I talk about it in the book. I don't have time to go into his stand on the convention and his stand on independence and his stand on statehood. But to my mind, he's just behind the curve on all of these things. And, and I'm sorry, I don't know, again, I don't know why I'm apologizing. But I didn't set out to write that book, but the more I got into it, you know, it just, he just didn't seem as relevant as, um, you know, we, as we've been led to believe. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, okay. great. Oh, yes. If, if you can indulge me, I have a comment and then, of course, a question. Sure. Um, my, my comment being that um, I think efforts such as this um, I th are, are crucial in redefining Texas exceptionalism. You know, I, I think... Um, you know, learning far more about the the ethnic and political diversity as it was changed by our revolution does lend to kind of a uh, a, a more textured version of our exceptionalism. And yeah. as the lone mm -hmm. person here wearing all Texas stuff only by accident, um, but my question for you is, uh, I'm I'm fascinated by the story about Chief Bowles. Um, and maybe the question is rooted in um, my own misunderstanding or presupposition towards um, you know, the cultural, the, the Native American cultural, um, uh, their cultural ideal as we understand them towards land ownership. Yeah. And was the effort that he was making as stark as it appears to me as like a cultural appropriation towards land ownership as he was making this or was, Who, was this? Bowles is? Yeah. Well, I think part, I talked about Mexican foot dragging and I didn't go into detail because it is such a complicated story. Uh, and there are many parts to it, uh, but I will point to one uh, in 1829 uh, when Mieri Tehran uh, realizes that, you know, the Anglos are coming no matter what happens. And uh, he tries to get uh, Mexicans to move north, and, and that isn't happening. And so finally, as a last resort, he says, 
there are thousands of Native Americans here. They're peaceful. We need to Hispanicize them. And so that's the, uh, one of the saddest things is that's when the, it really does look as if the stars are in alignment for the Cherokees. They're going to get land. Uh, but what Mir sorry, what Mier Iteran says is we need to give them 100 plot, uh, 100 acre lots. And that's very, very time consuming, takes a lot of effort. Uh, the Mexican bureaucracy was very uh, thinly stretched, uh, you know, especially in Nacogdoches. Um, they didn't have time, they didn't have the resources, and the Cherokees didn't want to do it anyway. Uh, the Cherokees wanted a big land grant that would be held in common by the tribe. And so Miert y Tehran's idea that we're going to make these small farmers, small property owners, that was never going to fly. Uh, but, you know, he dies, uh, and we never see whether it could have, it could have happened. But once Mieri Tehran uh, dies, the, that, that, um, uh, that project is put, it dies, dies with him. Mm -hmm. And so that's just another chapter in this really sad story about the Cherokees who had asked for land back in 23. And when the revolution breaks out, uh, they still hadn't gotten it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We're going to ask you questions and then we're going to sign some books. <laughs>